You win this battle, man, I'll soon be dead I'll glue your face to my dick so I can fuck with your head I got metaphors coming through my pores You've probably never been in a battle before So, hope you realize your mistake There ain't no party cats or candles, this won't be a piece of cake Put Folks, welcome to the Before Hours Podcast an Internet radio phenomenon hosted by an occasional morning person I ask the most interesting people I know about their sleep, their routine Life, love, stress, and setbacks If you want to talk to us, you may do so in one of two ways The first one is to email the Before Hours Podcast at gmail.com Or you could slide it to my DMs on Instagram, Bobby Sheehan, LOL, LOL, because you know I bring the laughter. But for now, comedian, good friend, and I'm going to go ahead and say it, a good man, Keith Chase. How you doing, Keith? Hey, I'm uh, I'm good, Bobby. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, dude. Uh, happy to be here. It's, We've been uh, trying to do this for a while, and the schedules just couldn't align. And, uh, you know, I had my people call your people. Your people called my people. Uh, then we figured out that our people weren't even people. Yeah, we didn't. We actually... <laughs> I don't have a secretary, nor do I have the uh, money to have a secretary, but I feel like I need a secretary, Keith. I, don't look at me. It's, I, <laughs> like, that's not, why I had you on the podcast. I was like, I was like if you can't afford a secretary, mm -hmm. don't look at me. No. Because I, I don't come cheap. Ooh. No, not for secretarial work. <laughs> Dude. I don't know. It's crazy, man. I feel like I've had this thought recently in the last few weeks is that I don't have a very chaotic life, but because I live this gig economy lifestyle, like stand up wise, I am so close to forgetting what I have to do at any given minute. And I feel like most of my mornings are spent like I'm so married to iPhone reminders. I have an iPhone, not to flex that. I feel like most of my life is, hey, don't forget that you have that you have to do something in a half hour and then you have to do another thing in two hours and another thing in four hours. Yeah. I mean, it's good that you're putting the reminders in. Yeah. You know, it's like I was going to say, if you're this disorganized, you do have a smartphone <laughs> like Google. Google is a fucking, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a wonder tool. You just have all these different. You know, you have, you know, you have your Google calendar, your Gmail, your, I don't know, fucking, I don't know. I don't know. I don't use Google for anything else, just calendar and Gmail. So uh, I think there's a search engine function, but I haven't found it yet. Yeah, this is, um, I am very organized, uh, which I feel like is a pro, you know. That's oh, good. Yeah. He's organized, but it's because my brain is so fundamentally broken. That the the phrase I'll remember that for later is something that does not apply to me. No, I but it's what I like to do is I just like to write everything that I know I have to do, like coming up, just like list it out. Just take a just literally just write it down on a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Keep it where you know you're gonna be, uh, where you'll see it and you're like, all right, just check things off mm -hmm. as you go. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, all right, you want to reach out to this person, you're trying to get you're trying to book this person for your podcast, you're trying to do this just boom, 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 boom. And then it's like, you know, and then as things sort of continue on. But uh again, don't I don't come cheap. So you don't come cheap, dude, but you have supremely blue eyes has anyone told you that before this would be the first actually i i my entire life on my driver's license it says brown so this is a first mm -hmm. uh no it's we uh, by the way <laughs> did not for those watching we did not uh plan to dress exactly alike no it just happened no uh <laughs> you're where for those just listening we're both i'm wearing my standard bobby sheen uniform which is uh blue shirt blue jeans black shoes and you were also wearing blue shirt, blue jeans, black shoes, but with a little bit of red. Yeah. But I, I also have a bit of red. If you I got the saying. Jordans of, you know, mostly white with black and red detailing. But mm -hmm. um, it doesn't help that we're like virtually the same height, too. Like we're like I could be like it's like I'm almost trying to be you. Ooh, is why I think this that yeah. you'd be the first person in history to ever do that. To you know what? I didn't want to bring it up right away, but it is true. Keith and I are both short kinks. In fact, your Instagram handle, and we'll do plugs at the end, is uh, Chase the Short Guy. Yeah. So people know exactly where they stand when they visit I, How do you feel about being called a short king? I, I hate Oh, it. I always use it ironically, dude. Oh, I hate it so fucking much. Dude, well, here's the thing. Okay, so women, uh, big girls, shout out to the big girls, no disrespect. They will unironically, some of them, call themselves BBWs, big beautiful women. Right. I know no man in my life that unironically calls himself a short king. I do it to myself because it's funny, 
You know, the idea also there's like a bit of like, like I think black people call themselves kings and queens, which is kind of ironic if you think about the history of kings and queens, but I never said it in all earnest. It's always a joke. I I just have a whole bit where I just sort of like break it down about why I don't like mm-hmm. it's you know what? It's it's so it's just so patronizing. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> just like it's like, oh, it's like it's like short. It's like here's, you know, and I say, because they tried to do like, you know, they have like hot girl summer and stuff. They yeah. tried to do short king spring, which, you know, it hot girl summer is bullshit because People want to fuck hot women all the time. That's not a summertime activity. That is a any 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 time, any place. Like if you're but, you know, a lot of people, they're not attracted to short men. And so that doesn't change during the spring, Mm -hmm. especially not during allergy season. Mm. You know, we're getting sneezed on all the time. So we're, (laughs) we're gross, too. So it's just like, all right, well, this is just it's just so. Ugh, it just makes me cringe and I just hate the, you know, I just hate the moniker, but luckily I've been, you know, dating the same person for the last eight years, so mm-hmm. it doesn't really affect me. Yeah. But I will exploit it for comedy. Right. When appropriate. It's, well, we're in an identitarian uh, um, moment in standup where like you got to put everything that you are in your bio you know, so even yeah. if it's something like as irrelevant and like silly as like your height, oh, if it is unusual, <laughs> yeah, I have five two in my bio. That's hilarious, <laughs> dude. Yeah, five two. But you know what? Napoleon wasn't that much taller than five two. I don't care. <laughs> He's like, I, I, I. Oh, so Keith, you don't think representation matters? <laughs> dude, they, everyone fucking shits on you. They say you have a complex. You, mm-hmm. they say you have a Napoleon complex mm-hmm. if you're just like. Because here's the thing: short guys, we are. I don't want to say marginalized, but we are overlooked. <laughs> I was like, we're not. We I mean, shall overcome, assuming there's a step stool. We we have a wage gap. Short men have a wage gap. Um, you know, we're not taking it seriously. We don't get as many um, like job opportunities. We have worse mental health. And like, but nobody, we do have an easier time on airplanes, I will say. That's true. But like, but nobody cares. And it's also like, especially like, cause you know, we're both white guys. So it's like, everyone's like, oh, you're straight white men. Like, what do you have to complain about? And you're like, mm. well, I guess that's true. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it, but it, but the height thing it does, you know, like, I don't know if you get this, but if you're in like a circle, like just kind of bullshitting with your friends mm-hmm. and you're like trying to make a point and you're just like, you know, you're almost like a little dog just trying to like, yep, yep just trying <laughs> to get their attention. Cause you're trying to say something by the time they notice you, they've moved on to a different topic. Ooh. You and might so, need better friends, Keith. I, I, think, I think I need <laughs> shorter friends. <laughs> friends that actually see, like can physically see me. Ah, uh, okay. Nice. We just You just hang out with uh, actual little people? Oh, God. Yeah, I'll mm-hmm. be their ruler. That's the thing. If a little person is listening to this right now, they're furious. I'm sure. Listen, it, it's... Uh, I mean, you know, that's, an, uh, that's a legitimate... According to job applications, that's a legitimate disability. Have you seen this? So, no. Well, the ability to lift 40 pounds. <laughs> hmm. I didn't get that one. Well, so, because in job, uh, some job descriptions have the ability to lift 40 oh, pounds. Oh, for like blue collar work. Right. So it's like, you know, because little people sometimes, I don't know, they could maybe only weigh like 40 pounds and little people aren't like ants. They can't lift their own body weight. Okay. So that's probably discrimination right there. If a, if a job application is like, can you lift 40 pounds? And they're like, I can't lift that much. You know what I mean? Well, I guess if like, that's the confines of the job, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, if it's a, if a job requires you to know how to do math mm-hmm. and you failed math, that's not discrimination. You just don't have the skill set. Little people have the squeaky voice, by the way, Maxim, can we look that up? They do have the, the, I think it's cause the, I think that, I think maybe like their lungs are compressed more. Ah, so it is a disability. It's called dwarfism, right? Which so, I think they should change the so name. So this of. is so this is the thing about the the disability form. So when you you know when you f- fill out a job application, right, you put in all your experience and stuff, and then when you get to the um, the uh, you get to those forms at the end where it's like were you in the military? You know the um, demographic forms. You know, there's always the one about disability, mm-hmm. and lately. And this wasn't pre, this was, this is a post pandemic development, Mm -hmm. you know, it lists like different examples, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, mental health issues or, you know, if you suffer from, uh, any sort of illness like cancer or something, if you're Chinese and then, uh, one of them now says short stature, 
but in parentheses, they have to write dwarfism. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so guys like you and me can't <laughs> use that as a, because uh, we're technically not, we technically don't have dwarfism, we're just short. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's, ju it's just uh, maybe sometimes a bit of a social barrier, but it'd be the equivalent of a woman being like, I have small tits. Is that a, <laughs> is that a disability? It's like, no, so it's, like, <laughs> it's like, no, someone will fuck you. That's just how it goes, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. it's like listen you know small I think, tit queens by the way you can slide into my dm you know i think it was like i read a statistic where it's like you know even if 99 percent of the world um finds you was it 99 percent of the world finds you unattractive that means there's still 80 million people with a fetish so oh that's beautiful <laughs> hell yeah dude there's someone out there for everybody i really i think that's a beautiful thing hell yeah so yeah Gotta Life find. is good, man. Hey, uh, I need to ask you, because this is the Before Hours podcast. Are you a morning person or a night person? Oh, I am a... Yeah, I don't I don't even know if I'm if I'm if any kind of person these days. I'm definitely <laughs> I, I'm definitely more of a I'm definitely more of a night person. I'm more of like a mid afternoon person, really. Mm. Like just kind of like three o'clock, I think, is my is my peak. You know, that's unusual. Keith, because I've been asking people this question and people either say that they come alive in the morning or they come alive at night. But almost everyone says that mid afternoon they get a little bit sad. But this is where you shine at three p.m. I was well. I'm. I usually. Uh, I mean, lately I've been going to bed sad and I've been waking up sad. So uh, yeah, usually by mid afternoon I can get my shit together enough where I'm like, all right, this can be a little bit. Uh, I feel a little bit better mm -hmm. <laughs> during the day. Um, yeah, dude, it's been a it's been a rough couple of days. Uh, you know, you and I were talking about this before. Um, you know, I won't forget where I was when I found out that Trump uh, was <laughs> indicted, <laughs> was convicted <laughs> on, th on 34 counts. Uh, <laughs> I was, <Woo>. uh, <laughs> I was sitting Shiva. We had just buried my father. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's, uh, which that's a minor inconvenience, but then when you hear about Trump, Trump dying, oh yeah, that yeah. was, uh, <laughs> it sucks too. Cause my, you know, uh, the entire time my dad was in the hospital, he was watching that trial. And he hated Trump. So it's uh -huh. like the day we buried him was the day that all of those uh, all those uh, convictions or the he was convicted. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you're like, if he held on uh, a few days longer, you could have seen Trump get convicted. Yeah, he might have. Uh, that might have given him hope enough to get better. But he uh, unfortunately decided that it was time to uh, it was time to go. He uh, yeah, he passed away on Memorial Day. So. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I don't know what I should say. He, I know it's, it's intense. So we kind of, we kind of, uh, we may have said it a little bit too quickly. So Keith's dad did pass away on Memorial day and I, uh, messaged you my condolences. Yeah, you did. You did. Um, and, uh, and then I was, you know, it's this awkward thing. Cause I'm like, when do I bring up, Hey, are we still doing the podcast? The podcast? I, and yeah. you responded it's like, see you Saturday, see you Saturday. And I, I love, so you're of the Ashkenazi posse. Yes. But that was a very Irish Catholic thing you did. Cause you're like, I'm sad, but I have an obligation. Yes. It, so, uh, yeah, dude. Well, first of all, uh, a lot of people reached out to me, um, and I got back to them individually. Uh, you know, I made sure everyone got an individual response. I must've had like 30, 40 people DM me. And it's, mm -hmm. It was it was kind of I had to like do it in batches because like the first twenty four hours I think were the hardest and mm -hmm. so when you you know anytime I opened something that kind of reminded me of it it just kind of like you know came over me right but uh, in the Jewish faith so the way it works is it's not like Catholics or um, you know or other Christians where you do the wake and it's like you know the you have the whole thing for like a week and then you bury them mm -hmm. so Jews we don't embalm. So our belief is that Too much money. <laughs> that's right. You see what they're charging for the funeral. But uh, no, our belief is that you're supposed to return the body uh, back to God as is. And so you bury the body as soon as possible. You're supposed to do it within 48 hours. So we don't embalm. I think also part of that is so because once they're buried, I think it makes it easier to move on. Mm -hmm. So what you do is, is you bury and then you do what's called uh, Shiva. So you, so that's when you go back to the, the home of the deceased and, you know, your friends and family come and everyone brings food and they're supposed to comfort you, um, except on, on Shabbat. So Saturday today, uh, Shiva 
is going to be, so we're doing this, it's about a quarter after two and Shiva won't be until after the sun goes down because it's technically the Sabbath. So you don't do that on Shabbat. Okay. So that's why I was like, all right, well, because I did have to cancel some stuff. So it was like, I had to turn down something because we kind of, because we knew it was going to happen. So we had to turn, so I had to turn something down and then like, I had to reach out to, uh, something I had booked on the road I was featuring and I was like, Hey, I can't like, it was like four days before. Cause I was like, you're going to have to find a replacement for me. Cause I was literally like, Hey, uh, this is happening. I don't know when, but it's happening. And so I can't, uh, unfortunately I can't make it. And so it was the same day it happened to be as his funeral. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a tumultuous, relentless six or seven months. Um, my father was really the last two. So luck, you know, now we're just sort of like, all right, everything's kind of, hopefully this is it for a while. And then, you know, you know, life happens, but, uh, yeah, he, uh, it was a, uh, yeah. So I'm sorry if I can't be as a, uh, I'm going to try and be lighthearted as lighthearted as I possibly can, but it is something that's mm -hmm. been weighing on yeah, me. Keith, let's do some character work. You're going to, your character is going to be a guy who's not currently grieving. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're so going to like, pretend to be someone who all of his relatives are alive <laughs> and well, <laughs> everyone's healthy. Mm -hmm. No one's hungry. Just do, you know, mm -hmm. do your best to be, um, you know, do your best to be part of the 1% is what I is. You kind of, but like you kind of, and, and I haven't gone through grief, like you're going through grief. Um, but when someone in your life does die, you sort of do have to pretend to the outside world that everything is fine. And that has always been a trip to me. So yes and no, I would say like, always take time to, to feel it. Right. Because mm -hmm. if I think if you suppress it, it's going to come out in other ways at other times, like mm -hmm. you're just gonna, you know, feel like if I just suppress it all now, like six months from now, like I'm just going to be like shaving and Nick myself and just like scream like fuck. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just important to also, like I said, I think the first 24 hours, the first like full day after he passed, cause then it's like, all right, so he passed Monday night and then Tuesday, that was all me. That was all for me. Like I got to And then Wednesday I'm like, well, I got to write an obituary. Like oh, I have wow. to sit down and pen an obituary to say at his funeral. And, you know, we have to meet with the rabbi and discuss like, you know, how it's going to go and, you know, what items do we want to place in his casket? Um, you know, and like, where are we going to do it? And where's the cemetery? And so, and then it's like, yeah, you have to like, and because again, like I said, Jews do it so quickly, like, oh, we have to. Uh, we have to make arrangements like this isn't something that just happens like we had to uh, buy a grave because like we had like this plot that belonged to like my grandfather's family, you know, so it's a bunch of like random cousins from other. So we had to like, you know, find an open grave and then because they only we only own two to begin with, but we had to buy one for my dad's brother and now my dad. So it's like we had to find, you know, so it's a lot of it's a lot of like work to do in such like a short amount of time while you're feeling what you're feeling. So you're just like, all right, well, we got to do this and we got to make sure we're doing it right because, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to fucking do a bang up job for, mm -hmm. uh, for my father. So it was, uh, yeah, it was just like such a quick, and then we had the funeral. And then once I think the funeral was over, you're like, all right, well now you're like, okay. And then you sit Shiva you know, like I said, you see your friends, your family, everyone comes to comfort you. And then you're like, all right, well, I still have another week of bereavement leave through my job. So, you know, that, that, that's a plus. It's like, all right, well, you get, you get two paid weeks off if someone, if someone in your immediate family passes. So, and the following two weeks of just kind of doing a shoddy job because no one's going to be like, Hey, come on, Keith. Right. And that's kind of, well, that's the thing is it's like, you know, it's like anything else. It's, you know, you can't, you can't grieve forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm 29 years old. My dad was there for us. You know, obviously he wasn't, he was by no means a perfect man. Um, I, I've, you know, I'm not going to get into sort of his, uh, you know, some of the, the, uh, his flaws, but you know, listen, he was there for us. You know, how many people do we know, uh, you know, whose, uh, whose dads left them or, you know, 
God forbid they passed away when they were very young. Mm. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it gives you perspective. What gave me really weird perspective uh, was my aunt. So she, so like I said, my dad's brother is uh, passed his older brother. He passed about 30 years ago, uh, shortly before I was born. And my two cousins were very young. They were five and eight when it happened. And, uh, you know, we're sitting at my dad's bedside in the hospital and she was kind of like remembering what she went through with her husband. And she was like, uh, you know, he missed, you know, he missed the girl's entire lives. And then you're thinking, it's like, all right, well, you know, 30 years, you know, he was there. So, uh, it's like, you know, he would, he would fucking kill me if I was like, oh man, I can't believe I lost my day. He'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> he'd be like, he'd be like, you know what I mean? He's like, he's like, you'd be like, you'd be like, you're lucky. I'm he Like you were lucky you had me for this long, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like, you know, you want to, you know, you want to cry and you want to grieve, but at the same time, you're like, I have a lot to be thankful for, mm-hmm. um, for now. Cause then we have to pay all his medical bills and that's going to be a bitch. Oh uh, yeah. For, for those unfamiliar, Keith is a citizen of the United States of America. So he's probably in medical debt now. Well, I'm not in medical debt. My mm. father's in medical debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so we have to we have to figure out how we're going to pay off of his. You know, uh, you know, it's we'll figure it out. That's just part of the. Everyone's got to go through that. Unfortunately, now, the 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 idea that shiva has to happen, or I'm sorry, that the burial and uh, for Jewish people has to happen very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so, like you said, there's a lot of logistical stuff that has to happen. Um, I'm wondering if, if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because for me, I think, uh, when I'm not having a good time, if I could keep myself busy, right, it turns the thoughts off for a little while and just go on autopilot. That's what, that's what I was doing on Tuesday, mm-hmm. which is why it was so hard for me to respond to everybody. Like, you know, I want to just go through it like, oh my God, thank you. Thank you. But you're like, you know, I message five people back and I would start crying and I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, I got to take a break. <clears throat> so it's, uh, yeah, it's tough, which is why I said like, you know, and again, you know, I mean, listen, funeral homes, especially Jewish ones, like they know the deal. Yeah. They know that they're like, yeah, we got to we got to do this. We got to do this quick. I mean, that's why there's a the business of, you know, of mourning, really, because they're like, yeah, we you know, we know that you guys want to do what's uh, best for your deceased relative. And we know you have to do it quickly. And so we're pros at that. And so mm-hmm. that's why. um you know, thankfully they, you know, we think they did a pretty good job. I mean, we had at the same funeral home we had for both my grandparents and then, you know, like I said, the cemetery. So yeah, you know, it's just, uh, you know, from their standpoint, it's a business, you know, my uncle, he was, he was really, uh, he was in really bad shape and he was the one that had to make the calls. So we lost, so this is why it's like, it's like I said, it's been a tumultuous six months. Mm -hmm. Uh, Early December, my grandmother passed. So they both lost their, lost their mother. They were in the process of clearing out her house. They had sold the house, but, you know, they're in the process of, um, you know, and they're like, you know, again, they lost their older brother. They lost both their parents. It's like they're the last two. And now my uncle, he's the last one, you know, and it shouldn't have happened this quickly. Mm. Um, so kind of to give a bit of a and again, I'm sorry if this isn't as. Lighthearted is your normal podcasts. The listeners of the Before Hours podcast knows that sometimes we're silly and sometimes we're serious and sometimes we're both. But at the end of the day, it's it, this is the most important thing, Keith, is a podcast for the boys. So continue. Thank you. Uh, so in early November, I, I developed uh, something called interstitial lung disease. You developed? I developed it. Oh. So, uh, so I lost about six weeks, really more like two months of comedy because... Mm-hmm. So the first week I, I, I kind of felt like this, uh, like I got like maybe an infection and I had like some chest congestion. I walk up the subway stairs and I'd start coughing. And I remember being in a mic and I let out like a light cough during someone's set. And then the next person went up and just spent two of their five minutes, like just accusing me of faking it, just faking this cough. And I'm just sitting there like the fuck dude, like just do your, like you paid to do your set, do your set. Yeah. It's like, don't come after me. Like everyone was bombing. I think they just didn't want to bomb. Yeah. And, uh, then I saw the, him later that night and he like, tr- like doubled down. And then I was like, all right. And then a week later I was rushed to the emergency room cause it got a lot worse. I was having these violent coughing fits. Uh, like if I got up off the couch, I was getting winded. Oh geez. Um, and so I was supposed to do a show. Uh, I was supposed to do a show at the grizzly pear 
10 o'clock Saturday night or sorry, 10 o'clock Friday night. I was like so excited because like, you know, I just started getting like these, you know, a primetime spot on McDougal Street. I was like, this is it. So like, I didn't want to miss it, even though I was like, we, you know, I couldn't take a full breath. And so I went down to tie my shoes and I couldn't catch my breath. I wake up my girlfriend. I go, I have to go to the hospital. Oh, yeah. so I was in the emergency room. They thought I had pneumonia. That's, you know, that was what I was diagnosed with. And then, you know, they gave me some inhaler stuff and they discharged me after like two days because I was, you know, I felt better. And then, you know, they're like, yeah, you can just recover at home. Just come back in a couple of months for a, uh, a scan. So I go, you know, so for over the course of that week, I was feeling better. And then I started getting sick again. And then I get a call from one of my cousins who told me, uh, hey, your grandmother is in the hospital. And she apparently had a tumor in her back, like she fell and she's in the hospital and she's not doing so well. And so that was like, I mean, my grandmother was 96. So I, you know, I was kind of like, okay. Uh, so I called her. I didn't tell her that I was dealing with what I was dealing with. Um, so, you know, it would have killed her. And I think my dad, because he was dealing with her, mm. didn't want to, uh, like, I didn't want to scare anybody. Like right. I was like, there I was, I'm like, look. Either I'm going to be fine or I'm not going to be fine, but like, <laughs> I don't want to make people's lives harder yeah. than they already have to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually it got out because, you know, I told my mom knew. Mm -hmm. So my parents were split, but my mom told my sister and my sister kind of told everybody else. And then so. Uh, um, so that weekend goes by. It's Thanksgiving. I go to the emergency room again, but they let me go home and then I wake up and my rib is just. I broke it from coughing. Oh, geez. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't. And so I kind of just powered through for like two more days. I go to the, I go to our urgent care and they're like, you have to go to the hospital. Like there is no, so I went back to the emergency room and they admitted me and I was there for about a week. And that's when they figured out that I had this, uh, this interstitial lung disease. I had something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a, uh, which basically means that like my lungs become inflamed if I'm exposed to uh, some kind of particulate matter that I might be allergic to. However, that wasn't the case. We later found out that it was because I was taking antidepressants and Prozac uh, in particular and other SSRIs in like it's a one in a million shot. If you're on antidepressants, guys, don't consult your doctor. Stop taking Pro Prozac. <laughs> it's a one in a million. We're two comedians. Listen to us. It's a one in a million shot. Mm -hmm. But it can happen. And, you know, thankfully, that's what the cause was, because mm -hmm. that, you know, at least that way, like, I, you know, I was able to make a recovery. But like I said, I just lost all this time. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, and then so my last day in the hospital, you know, we're being told like, oh, my grandmother's going to hospice. Um, you know, she doesn't have a lot of time left. My sister was flying home. And then we get a text from my dad, like, you know, she passed away. Uh, funerals on Friday. So this was my last full day. The next day I was discharged. I get to the funeral. Um, and my dad had gained a shit ton of weight. And we thought it was because he was, um, we thought it was because he was just like stress eating and he wasn't sleeping and he was drinking and just, you know, just trying to manage the stress of losing his mother mm -hmm. and taking care of her. Uh, so, you know, and then the file, you know, we, a few months go by, I'm trying to, you know, you miss, you miss any, you know, you miss more than a week in comedy. People forget about you. They think you quit. So it's like, you know, I, even though people knew I was in the hospital, you know, the thing is you get out of line, someone, uh, you know, a hundred other comics come and rush to take whatever space you are occupying. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, when I saw you were in the hospital, <clears throat> I was like, thank Christ, dude. Yeah. I'm going to try to get one of his spots. Yeah, for real. That's how it kind of, that's how it felt. Cause coming back, all these bookers change and I'm like, I don't know who books what. Uh, and then it's like, they're like, where were you when the transition? I was like, I was, you know, so it's like just a lot of trying to work a lot of that back. And I was starting to, I was really starting to gain it all back. And then, uh, you know, my girlfriend and I, we went away to Costa Rica. We had a lovely trip. And the last day my uncle texts me, he goes, Hey, your father's in the hospital. Uh, they suspect perforated bowel. Can you uh, can you come home and take care of the dogs on Long Island? And I was like, uh, well, I'm out of town right now. I'll be back there as soon as I can. Um, and then he calls me. He was like, yeah. So they were loading your dad into the scanner. His blood pressure dropped, and he spiked a fever. And my girlfriend, who's a who's a resident, is a pediatric resident. I you know I tell her she goes, that's sepsis. 
So he got a blood infection from the perforated bowel. And then we found out that he had cancer. He had uh, stage three because of perforated. They were treating it like stage four colon cancer. He never got colonoscopy. And he was, he had ulcerative colitis as you know, for the last 30 years. And he was self, he was a, he was a physician. So he was just prescribing himself medication to make himself feel better. Uh, and then all this happened. And then, so like we go to see him, he's in rough shape. Like he, you know, cause they had intubated him and they extubated him. So he was still kind of like loopy from all the sedatives. And I remember he was like, I'm talking to his doctor. His doctor's like, yeah, you know, he, you know, it's like, we got him on the antibiotics in time. He's trending upward, you know, once he gets better, we'll discharge him. You know, we'll get him back here in a few weeks for, to remove the, you know, cause they thought it was just an abscess. And my dad looks at me, he goes, Keith, I'm dying. And you're like, no dad, you're fine. The doctor says you're fine. Um, and, uh, then two days later I go back. He, he wins a septic shock. His kidneys shut down. So he had something called end stage renal failure. He was on dialysis and it was pretty, you know, and then it was pretty much just this up and down. Like they had to remove his colon. They weren't sure if he was going to make it. Then he was like having complications for, like after the surgery, like his gut wasn't working properly and they couldn't figure out why. Um, then they found out he had another tumor and so they were trying to radiate it. It was just like this whole. And then my dad finally was like, I just, I can't do this anymore. Uh, we think part of the reason was he would have to go to rehab and the only rehab that would have accepted him in his condition was in Rahway, New Jersey. And we as a thought death was and a as better a option. And as a native Brooklyner <laughs> and native Long Islander, he was like, I'd rather die than spend the rest of my days in Northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. so, Sounds like a Bruce Springsteen song. I think it's the opposite. I think Bruce Springsteen would rather die than live anywhere besides New Jersey. You know. That man is New Jersey. He is. Shout out to Bruce Springsteen, honestly. So that's what you just described. It's like, God damn, if it's not one thing, it's another. Right. And yeah. It's just been, it's just been like the punches just keep coming. Like the hits just keep coming. You're like, when is this going to fucking end? Mm -hmm. Cause also like, like I said, it's hard because it's like, you want to continue to do comedy. And so the last two months, it's like, I've had to kind of, choose between going to visit him going to do you know trying to do mics and do shows so it's like if i didn't have anything booked i'd go out to see him right um and again these days it has you know i you know it's not like i was having it's not like i had a ton of spots so mm -hmm. i got to see him quite frequently um and so yeah dude it was it's just been a uh a rough just i you know <laughs> you know it sucks dude but i i hope to god this is like the end mm -hmm. of all that dark period of just the last because you're like all right this finally it's finally kind of like this is it he's gone mm -hmm. and now i can start piecing my life back together which was what i was trying to do before after my own illness i mean and this is just how i look, look at it and it's it's not like a pie in the sky perspective but it's like You've been through like a terrible thing and now, you know, you could go through terrible things. Yeah, dude. Uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, smooth seas never made for a good sailor, but you know, it is kind of like, you're like, all right, how much of this can I really yeah. take? You know, how, how many, how many, uh, rough seas am I going to get? Right. Poseidon, can we relax for a little while? I mean, I will say this, you know, if I lose my job in the next six, you're like, all right, well, I guess this isn't as bad as everything else. You right. know, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of death, a lot of illness. So it's like, all right, well, you know, you lose a job, you can get a new job. You, mm -hmm. you know, you can find another. So you're like, I'm like, but I'm like, what else can go wrong? Right. You know, because at the end of 2023, I was like, you know, because this all happened at the end of 2023. So I was like, um, or at least with my illness and my grandmother. So I was like, it can't get it can't get worse. 2024 is going to be my year. I'm going to, you know, everything's looking up. Mm -hmm. And then. Unfortunately, I was uh, I was proven incredibly, incredibly wrong. <laughs> so 
Uh, I'm just gonna expect the worst from now on. There you go. And anything, anything mm -hmm. that can constitute a win, mm -hmm. like any, just like anything neutral that cons that can just constitute a win. You're like, all right, I guess I'll take it. Yeah. Expect the worst, prepare for the best Yeah. Or vice versa. So I'm curious cause you mentioned something earlier about, so you find out your dad passes away and then like pretty soon thereafter, you're like, well, I have to say something at the funeral. Yeah. So, because that's, I always think, because I'm an only child. Right. So I think I'm going to have to do that for both of my parents when they die. Mm -hmm. So that always is to me like, oh God, I have like a homework assignment after the worst thing that happens, happens. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, I only wrote like two pages. Like I kept it concise because I wanted to be like, mm. you know, again, you know, my father was a, I'm not going to lie and say he was, you know, he's a deeply flawed man. Okay. But he was, you know, he was there for us. He did, you know, he taught me how to swim, how to play catch. Mm -hmm. You know, he never missed any of our games or school concerts or anything like that. So you're like, that was kind of like what I wanted to memorialize was like the good stuff and mm -hmm. not necessarily like the, you know, so, but you're like, all right, let's just kind of keep this short. My sister, my sister's not a very, I'm a lot more in touch with my emotions than she is. Okay. So she was like, oh, I'm going to try and be light and funny. And it was just like, you know, and as was, a she the, was she she the opener for you? No, she was the she was the headliner when Ooh. it came to the obituaries. OK, she was like, you know, let's put it after everyone. And and it was just like, here's the thing as com like as a comic, mm -hmm. you're like, all right, well, if you're going to be funny, be fun, like, you know, make sure you're going to do it right. Mm -hmm. And she's not, you know, she doesn't she, you know, she likes comedy. You know, she's like. She's decide, you know, she's like, maybe, maybe I'll do an open mic. Maybe not really, but like, mm -hmm. um, but she just gets up there and she just tries to be kind of like light. And like, I was like, you do realize like our dead father's in a casket, <laughs> like six feet. You're just, and it was just right. like, I literally like cringing with my girl. And I, like, I told my girlfriend, I was like, if I die before her. <laughs> do not let her speak at my <laughs> funeral. Oh no. And cause they were, cause they were live streaming the, and here they were live streaming. And she was like, I'm getting so many compliments about how funny my speech was. And I was like, and like, I just don't have the heart to tell her. I'm like, listen, there's like, dude, you fucking killed it. And good set. You know, yeah, she, yeah, I, was yeah, like, yeah. I was like, Oh no. Also, no one's going to be like, Hey, the eulogy for your dad. It was good, but I have some notes. Yeah. No, like I was, <laughs> I, I was like, I found it. I told her, I was like, I found this distasteful, but this, Oh really? But I okay. mean, I'm mm -hmm. the only, I think I'm the only person who's allowed to do that mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I'm also losing my father. Yeah. Like we're both, you know, we're not ha like we're full siblings. So it's like, if anyone's, has the right to kind of give it to her straight. I was like, it's got to be me because none of my other relatives, are, you know, none of my cousins are going to be like, oh, that was horrible. You know, yeah, you're yeah. just like, I was like, don't speak at my funeral. If I die, stay away. <laughs> like, don't even, you know, you can come to the burial. You can shovel some dirt on me, but don't, <laughs> don't speak. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, it's odd to, because, uh, I've had a lot of, not not in my nuclear family, but in my extended family, there's been a lot of death. I joke that like Irish people don't live that long. You know what I mean? So I've been right. to a lot of weddings and or a lot of weddings, uh, a lot of funerals, a lot of wakes. And some people really nail it. Some right. people do everything right. And some people just can't do. It. I remember, remember this isn't actually my family. This is my uh, my friend's family. Uh, what, what was it? It was my, my friend, his dad passed away and his cousin was like, I have social anxiety. It's like texting him. I want to come into the funeral home, but I have social anxiety. And he was like, hey, man, uh, it's really not about you today. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a little wow. You know, I <laughs> if you I, I'm just imagine if you got that text from like a distant relative, like, hey, I'm outside the funeral home, but I do have social anxiety. I'd be like, hey man, don't worry about it. You yeah, know, don't, I just appreciate don't you. It's like, listen, man, don't come. I appreciate you wanting to make the effort. Mm -hmm. Also, like now, you know, because it's post COVID, right. we were live streaming our funeral. Mm -hmm. Like they do that now, you know, Please in case. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're generating content, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what it is? It's, you know, I think it's, look, man, like people got to come from out of town, especially because, mm -hmm. again, Jews do it very quickly. So it's like, 
not everyone can book a plane ticket right. to get home in 40, you know, to get to Long Island in 48 hours and try. Mm. Uh, so it's like, you know, they'll, you know, you can watch it. It's in, you know, it's in 30, 45 minute long ceremony. And then, 4K? you know, we do the burial. I think it's in 4K. I'm mm. not going to sit here and pretend like I, you know, I've never live streamed a funeral. I, I tend to either go or go to like one of the other, you know, like a wake or a Shiva, but I've mm. never... Yeah. Uh, the only thing I live streamed was my girlfriend's med school graduation. That was because uh, that was during COVID. So she was only everyone was only allowed to guests. So uh-huh. I was just live stream. And it was just so like because, again, they have like the two cameras and they just switch back and forth. And the audio is like, you know, it's not this. Yeah. So I feel like they should have just done her graduation or and the funeral for that matter in this uh, at my friend's basement mm-hmm. podcast studios. <laughs> Yeah, that could be a, a nice side hustle for the podcast studio. Yeah, if you guys have empty slots, just you know, let people know that they can bury their loved ones in this tiny, tiny <laughs> space. I um uh thing about a shiva that I I really like because I've been to shivas before mm-hmm. is um, the free food. The free food, first of all, lots of uh, the pretty Jewish girls that are everywhere, but you're not supposed to hit on them because it's just shiva. Um, but. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm trying to think of like my show. I was like, not, not my dad Shiva. No. Yeah. That's not, I don't know. I'm sure maybe you went to a more popular deceased person's. <laughs> what, did, what did Michael Scott say? I want a pretty woman to cry at my funeral. Um, But I will say, okay, because Christians, uh, Catholics, I grew up Irish Catholic. We do a wake just similar to a Shiva, except for some reason, we all have to look at the dead body. I don't un- understand who started this or why it's yeah. a good thing to do. I'm creeped out by it every time. And I'm going to go ahead and say it a few times. Um, the embalmer it moved. didn't do it. Was that? <laughs> it moved. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute, I don't think this guy's dead. <laughs> I think he's trying to get it's like that. Like, it's like that scene in Goodfellas where Joe Pesci's like, the he's still alive. It's like he's trying, he's trying to get out of some debts. His, his bodies are going to come back. <laughs> he looks so peaceful in that coffin. His so chest like, is rising up and down. Don't don't worry about it. He's, he's got... It's like, is he trying not to smirk? What's going on here? <laughs> the, I've been to a couple of wakes, dude, where I don't know if the Undertaker is their first day, but they looked dead. <laughs> I mean, they are dead. You know what I mean? But like, you've been to a wake, right? Uh, I don't know if I've been to a wake. Mm-hmm. And if I have been to a wake, it wasn't open casket. That's the way to go. Because I've been to I've been to many wakes, many open caskets. And sometimes the the makeup is so good that they look nice and peaceful. And sometimes it looks like you're looking at a dead body, which you are. Yeah, I so in Judaism because again, we don't embalm. So, mm-hmm. you know, so we, uh, before the funeral service, uh, immediate family members are invited to do a viewing. Mm-hmm. So that's the time where it's like I said, like if you wanted to bury them with like a keepsake or something, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you put that in the casket and then you can just, you know, they'll take the cloth off their face. You can view their face. You know, I only looked for like maybe 10, 15 seconds. I just kind of nodded at the undertaker, like, you know, you can. You can go back, but otherwise, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I, I didn't do it for my grandparents. I did it for my dad. Cause you know, it's my dad. And, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to, I had like a couple of, uh, I had a photo and, uh, another keepsake I wanted to just put in the casket. So I was like, I gotta, you know, do the viewing. So mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, no, we don't do, we don't do open casket anything. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's, you know, it's gruesome. It's not, it's, and it's not supposed to be, um, yeah, you're not supposed to look at them and go, "Oh, well, they're you know they look so peaceful." They're so you're like, "Yeah, that is, that is a deceased man." Yeah, <laughs> you know, that is that is a corpse. You know. Yeah, it's interesting that different cultures have different things. I I learned that like there's an indigenous culture in mm-hmm. South America where they, they the basically, body. isn't that creepy? They just hang out with the body for a little while. Yeah, that's a little much. That's a you know either. I mean, listen, if you're going to eat it, eat it, you know, but don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but don't just hang out with it. It's, it's, like, it's like, you're just going to weekend at Bernie's in South. <laughs> just, yeah, that's just what they do in the rainforest, dude. Like, I don't know. 
it's like, dude, it's like the magic. Yeah, Cause like, here's the thing, like it's South America. So it's the Amazon rainforest. It's like, you know, the you know kinds of bugs that you're attracting, mm-hmm. you know, just like, you know, we just, when you're walking around the rainforest mm-hmm. and then you just have a dead body, just attracting all those like poisonous fly. And you're just like, this is, this sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. If any of uh, the specific indigenous culture in South America is listening to this podcast, first of all, thank you for listening. How did you find out about us? And second, you got to stop doing the thing with the dead. Bodies, yeah, right? the, there's a, it's like you're uncontacted for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a weird hang. Stop. <laughs> you're a weird hang, dude. Oh, man. So uh, I opened the podcast with asking about your uh, whether you're a night person or a morning person, because this is the before hours podcast. Um what has, right has now I'm a morning person? Oh, hey, there you go. Yes, because well, that actually segue that pun segues perfectly into what I was about to ask. There because what has it's been almost a week? What have the days been like? Uh, well, uh, you know, again, once we figure, like, once we knew, so Friday, we get the text from my uncle. He's like, "Your father is requesting hospice. He wants to go home. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just giving up." Um. And so we're like, okay, so Saturday I went out to see him. That was tough. And then I went to just go hang like at a club. Yeah, I was just like, all right, well, you know, I don't have any spots. I just kind of, you know, I'm trying to cheer myself up and I just couldn't. Mm-hmm. Like I was just like a wreck and I was like, I got to go home. Mm-hmm. So I went home Sunday. Uh, I don't even remember what I was doing Sunday. Like I, I was talking to my mom and then I was just kind of going back and forth with all of my, um, Again, I was just going back and forth with like, you know, just kind of canceling stuff because I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like I kind of ha- I went to bed and I kind of half expected a text or a missed call uh, letting me know about my father, but I didn't. And so I'm like, all right, it's Memorial Day. I got to go. But I call I got a call from my mom. It's like, you know, because he was on dialysis. He requested to stop dialysis, which is kind of like a supposedly is like a very painless, peaceful way to go, but you do start to become delirious and you start to become disoriented. And first he was agitated and then he just kind of like, didn't really know where he was. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to go out and see him. This is going to be my last time. And so I go out there. I, you know, my uncle's there. He had to go. I'm hanging, you know, I left like 10 minutes. I pretty much just was like, can I just have a moment to say goodbye? So I did. And then I went to go see my mom because my parents, you know, the, the hospital was in, was like halfway between where my parents live. So I went to go see my mom and, uh, you know, we went out to dinner. She made me pay. Uh, <laughs> she, she was like, I was like, I thought I was getting sympathy, a sympathy meal. And she was like, no, 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 this is making up for mother's day. And I was like, thanks. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, <Okay>. thanks mom. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, um, I go to, you know, so I go home that night. And I'm hanging out and at my grandmother's shiva call, my dad, my dad was like a bourbon aficionado. He gives, you know, and I'm on all this medication. I, you know, I can't drink really, at least not like hard stuff. My dad gives me this bottle of bourbon that he really liked. And I was like, all right. So once he got sick, I started drinking. And I was like, you know, he wanted me to enjoy this. So I was having a glass of it. Um, and then I get a text from my uncle to both me and my sister, which I think that's the right way to tell people. I know it sounds a little... If you're going to, cause I think it's also like one, you have to prioritize who you're going to tell first those, the six out of it. And two, you don't know if someone's not going to pick up like you, like their phone might be off. They might not pick up. So he just texted us. He was like, Hey, uh, your father passed away. So I just kind of like my girlfriend went to bed. I just kind of sat out crying. I cried myself to sleep. I cried when I woke up. Uh, like I said, throughout the day I was feeling better like Tuesday kind of in and out went, you know, cried again, Tuesday night. Wednesday, it start. You know, again, I had to write the obituary and just I had to like I really had to like pull myself together and just write the obituary. And then slowly, you know, you're like, all right, well, tomorrow's the funeral, and you just have this knot in your stomach that like this is it, and I gotta get up early. I gotta put on a suit. I gotta look good. I have to, you know, you you're somber, but you have to be composed. And you're just like, all right. And then, like I said, a lot of the, again, I think the, I think the reason why Jews do this is one, you know, we have our reasons, but also like it's to, it's to be able to move on, you know, to find comfort in those who are still with us 
as opposed to forever grieving the people that we lose. And so you're like, all right. So Thursday I go to bed yesterday. Uh, you know, I had some stuff to do and then I go out to shit. And so you're like, all right, it's getting like, it gets better. It gets slowly better every single day. It, it really is like a one day at a time. Uh, so, you know, like I said, the first 24 hours are the hardest by far. Uh, you know, and then you're like, all right, well, now I, I got to do stuff like this isn't just something that, you know, like I said, you just allow yourself to just sort of like feel the emotion and, you know, let it wash over you. You know, you're like, all right, well, at least I'm not dead inside. That's another thing where you're like, I would be worried if he passed, you know, cause when my, you know, my grandparents passed away, they were both very old and sickly and you're like, all right, it was their time. But with my father, you're like, it shouldn't have been like, this was, it was a very preventable death had he taken proper care of himself. And even then he could have, he really could, you know, he could have still, he could have still been with us um, had he chose not to withdraw his care. So you're like, all right, well, you know, it's untimely. You obviously have a much closer relationship with your parents and your grandparents, assuming that, you know, I mean, some people it's the other way, but um, you know, I had a more traditional, I guess, relationship. So you're like, all right, well, yeah, you just have to pull yourself together and do it. And so thankfully, you know, my girlfriend's been really good about being there and my, my mom and, you know, my friends and, you know, so luckily I'm able to function, you know, I know some people, if they lose someone, it's, you know, so you're like, all right, let's just kind of slowly. And, you know, I have this time off from work. You're like, all right, let's kind of just slowly start to make our way back. So yeah, that's, uh, I think that's been the, um, that's really been the takeaway as far as like how I'm like doing sort of, you're just like, you know, and eventually one day you're just gonna be like, all right, well I'm going to work and I'm going out and doing spots or mics after work and coming home and you're like, all right, well, I guess like I feel normal again. You know, there's, I think there's always going to be that, like that hole, but at the same time you're like, again, I was fortunate enough to have him up until this point. And so I can't say that. I have friends that can't say that. I mean, you know, that a parent that they didn't lose a parent. Um, I mean, again, even my cousins lost. Their, so you're like, all right, well, and again, like you, it's like, how many people do we know that just had shitty, like their dads were there, but they were shitty fathers. So you're like, all right, well, you know, at some point you just express gratitude for the time he was there. And unfortunately our relationship was a little complicated towards the end, but, um, you know, and I, kind of address that in my goodbye to him. But at the same time, you're like, all right, let's, he wouldn't want me to sit around just crying over him. So you just have to go out and, you know, you just uh, go out there. I, uh, that last point, he, he wouldn't want you to keep being sad. And we feel that way. Like I, I, I think about my own death, not in a suicidal way, but I, it is something that I think about. This is strange. It's the one thing we all experience, right? We're all going to die. Right. And yeah, I wouldn't want my friends and family to be in a permanent state no. of sorrow. And I think that's, I think that's the normal way to think about it. Cause I think a lot of people are, you know, I mean, that's just, I think that's just like a natural humility. You're like, look, like I love you. I was there for, you know, I was there, but at the same time, it's like, go like, but it's like, I want you to be happy. And it's like, you know, you realize these, you know, these people, like these people in our lives, they're not going to be around forever. So if, especially like a parent that like wants you to be successful, wants you to be happy. They're like, they're like, go do that. Don't fucking, you know, don't waste your time grieving me because all that's going to do is prevent you from going out and doing the things that you want to do. You know, and I understand, listen, I mean, people, it's not, you know, I've had, I, you know, in high school I lost, uh, I lost a couple of friends and, you know, I remember my mom telling me when I went to one of their funerals, she was like, there is nothing worse than burying your child. You know, that's why I'm kind of like a little bit grateful that my grandmother passed when she did. So she didn't even have to deal with the burden of losing another son. She was like, there's like the parent, the kids are supposed to bury the parents, not the other way around. So, you know, that's the kind of loss where you're like, okay, I can understand that would cripple someone, but you're like, this, this comes for all of us. And it, um, and it's like, yeah, it's, 
and, and you know, and I do think about when I was sick and you're like, the reason why I didn't tell him is because I'm like, there was a profound chance that I was going to die. Um, the doctors didn't know what was causing my, my lung issue at the time. And this is a little industry secret with medicine because my girlfriend said this and, you know, like I said, she's a resident and she goes, so the doctors looked at me and they're like, we're very concerned, which is the legal, you know, cause again, they can't just say, you know, for malpractice and legal reasons, that means that they don't know what's causing this mm -hmm. and they are afraid that they may, <clears throat> they may not find out and that they may not be able to treat you. Uh, and so my girlfriend, because she knew the the jargon, she went home and she was inconsolable. And for me to like tell my family that like, oh, by the way, I might actually die at the, like I, you know, there was a very profound chance my dad would have had to bury his son and his mother simultaneously. So, you know, luckily Which two for one would be like cost efficient, but oh still yeah, for sad. sure. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're like, all right, well, we're coming in for one funeral anyway. We might as well. But that's the, you know, and that's sort of like, you know, you kind of count, you know, like I said, you have to just find gratitude and solace. And you're like, yeah, he gave us a good life. You know, I say that I said that in my obituary. I said he gave us a good life. We wanted for nothing. He never missed a chance to say he loved us or was proud of us or never missed any milestones or special events. So you're like. Yeah, why am I why should I constantly feel this pain when he wouldn't want that? And he did give us a good uh he did give us a good life and he did you know, he did the best he could. And so and he was present and you're like, well, this is how he goes, this is how he goes. Um, you know, and again, you're a little angry because it was preventable, but at the same time you're like yeah, he wouldn't want us to just sit around and just bitch about him, about him dying. So what, I, what I've heard from other people, um, especially when something is preventable, because, uh, you know, I think a lot of us have people in our lives that don't take the best care of themselves. So what has uh, that been like kind of dealing with anger along with grief? Uh, I think a lot of the anger subsided as he was when he was sick, because at the same time, you're like, all right, well, you're in this situation now. How do we get out of it? Right. Or what's the next logical step? Because you're like, all right, well, you could have, you know, you can't go back and undo, you know, my dad can't go back six months and get a colonoscopy and they find the tumor and they treat him and he's better. Um, you're like, all right, well, how do we get you out of this mess? And I just remember like my dad looking at me, he was like, I am so, like when he was in the hospital, like two weeks before or a week before he passed, he was like, I am so sorry. Like he was like, he, cause he knew he got himself into this. Um, and again, you know, he was self-treating. He was, you know, he's writing himself prescriptions for medications, not knowing he had cancer, but thinking it was just his, uh, his IBD flaring up. And you're just like, it's like, look, like you can't, you're like, you did this to yourself. We want you to get out of this. But at the same time, you're like, you know, you can't. It's hard because you're like, you know, you're like, oh, what could have we done differently? But at the same time, it's like, that's not who my dad was. He always kind of just did. You know, he was always just in it for himself. And, you know, when it came to that kind of stuff, if you call him out like, hey, like, why are you kind of spending your money on shit you don't need? Or why are you like, you should go see a doctor. And he'd be like, oh, I can take care of my. So you're like you realize like there was, there was only one way this was going to end. And you're like, yeah, he just, uh, you know, so for me, it's more of like, there's no resentment there. There's like, I wish he wasn't like that. And I think, you know, I learned a lot from my own illness. Cause I, you know, there was definitely, I was definitely like, I was definitely really, cause my first hospital say I stayed at one, I stayed at a hospital that they took really poor care of me. So I was like, that affected me. I didn't want to go back to the hospital. That's what, you know, I really had to get forced to the second time. And I went to a different one and they took much better care. And I was like, Oh, I didn't realize like there was shitty hospitals and good hospitals. I thought they were all hospitals. So you're like, so for me, I'm like, all right, well, I learned that if I'm going through something physically and there really is a profound, like, Oh, I have to go, go take care of yourself, you know, go see a doctor, get checked up, you know, uh, 
And after this, you're like, all right, well, there's nothing I can, I can't go back and convince him to go see a doctor. What I can do is moving forward, knowing the pain that he wrought on me and my brother, or sorry, and uh, his brother and my sister and, you know, our mom just, you're like, all right, well, what can I do to prevent that? Mm-hmm. next time so or it's like what can i do to make sure that i don't put the people in my life through what my father put me through that's really all you can do you know you just kind of take away the lessons really i think to 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 have such a traumatic experience and then be able to learn something from it to the extent that you can learn from it is a beautiful thing and i think another beautiful thing is you taking the time while you're mourning to do this podcast. Thank you. I yeah, really appreciate it, Keith. And unfortunately, we've reached our time. So can you drop the socials for the listeners? Uh, yeah, you guys can follow me on Instagram and TikTok. My handle is Chase the Short Guy. As we said earlier in the podcast, you can also follow me on Twitter at Chasing Keith, uh, where I go by the name Juanon. Uh, <laughs> and that's that's pretty much it. And, you know, like I said, thank you so much for having me. I wish, you know, I regret that. I couldn't, it wasn't as lighthearted as I think your other uh, podcasts were, but I really appreciate you giving me the chance to tell my story and, uh, you know, find, you know, I found solace in being able to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, so I appreciate that. And thank you. I think morning is the thing that a lot of people go through, including our listeners. So they're going to appreciate this episode. I hope you do. I appreciate you being here guys. And I appreciate you guys or appreciate you being here, Keith and guys, (laughs) I appreciate you for listening and remember folks early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm just playing night owls. You know, I love you.